Welcome to the GTN Show. Yes, welcome to another episode. Today we have high tech dumbbells, new run records, and some new races on the calendar. Well, talking of events, it's time to plan your season. We're going to be discussing how to go about choosing those events and making sure you've got a full and exciting diary. We're going to start the show with some react to some of the stuff we've seen on social media. If you spotted something, leave it in the comments down below because we want to see it too. Uh, starting with this, uh, Jackson Laundry. Uh, he went off on a training camp and apparently it was going really well. He's in good form and then he had a bike crash. So he's hurt his thumb. He's going to have to have surgery on that thumb uh, and he's broken some ribs. So he's on the road to recovery and uh, not the way you want to start your season. No, it's definitely not a kind of January, but I guess it's only going to get better, hopefully. Well, yeah, him. let's hope so. Got the bad luck out of the way nice and early in the season. Now, some positive news we have spotted. Taylor Nib has a new bike sponsor. Or should I say, is this even her first bike sponsor? I think there was a lot of comments last year. You guys might remember watching her going and racing against the other 70.3 athletes on her road bike well now she has no excuses she has teamed up she said i'm thrilled to partner with trek the support has been tremendous and i'm excited for racing to begin yeah interestingly see she's uh got a tt bike there in front of exactly. her another road bike exactly yeah it's mm. gonna be exciting to see how much quicker she can go because i mean she was smashing up as it was wasn't yeah, she yeah exactly <laughs> On to Try News now, and the PTO have just announced that they have teamed up with a new event organiser ahead of their inaugural PTO Canadian Open, which is due to be held on 23rd and 24th of July in Edmonton. They are working alongside Do North Events and the City of Edmonton to put that race on. That's right, the PTO Canadian Open, of course, the first one of the PTO Tour, which will then also have the PTO US Open and the the Collins Cup in 2022, and then they'll add the European Open and the Asian Open in 2023, giving a total of five events with a million dollar prize purse for each of those events. Yeah, well, it's not just for the pros, there's an age group race as well, and the entries that open on the 25th of Jan, so just six days' time. That's right. Also from the PTO, they've announced that Lisa Bentley, 11-time Ironman champion and the Collins Cup Team International captain, has has been announced as a PTO board member from now on. So she'll be serving on that board, supporting the professional triathletes. Well, talking of races, Ironman have just added four more to their calendar, including two in Poznan, Poland. They've got 70.3 there and the 51.50, both at the beginning of September. And they've added another two 70.3s, one in July in Norway and one in October in Greece in Vuliag Mini. Yeah, well, hearing all these races at this time of year, it's definitely the time to sort of think about planning. And I thought, James, we could use this opportunity to find out from a recently retired pro, how do you go about planning your season. Obviously yours is going to be very different to most of our viewers, but, <laughs> yeah. but as a pro, how do you go about it? Well, as a pro, you have some freedom a little bit because you don't have to enter your races until as late as three weeks before. Generally, they're closed for, for a pro, yeah, which is a luxury that age groupers don't have. Um, generally, I'd work backwards, so obviously Kona happening in October, that would be the main one, and then obviously you've got to qualify for that, so I'd add a qualifying race maybe in April, uh, an Ironman, and then another Ironman in July, somewhere in the, in the summer, uh, as almost a backup for qualifying if I was qualified already or qualified early or qualified the year before even, uh, I would then, I could focus on something like a challenge Roth in July, something like that that didn't, didn't help me qualify for Kona. Uh, and then the rest of the year would kind of be slotted around those major events. So how many Ironmans would you do, was that like optimum in a year? What did you want to do if you could kind of plan your perfect year? Minimum was three, so I'd do the, the early season one, mid season one, and then obviously Kona. Um, I would sometimes do another one at the end of the year, end of the season, November, December, um, and I would often do a, a fifth one, uh, maybe two in the summer, one in, in July and another one in August. Uh, often did Ember Man uh, in August as preparation for Kona. So yeah, up to five full Ironmans. I mean, that sounds a huge amount. I mean, we don't see that many pros unless they're really chasing points or chasing qualification, doing five by choice. I mean, did you start to get fatigue after that? I don't know. I always found that I got fitter as it went went yeah. through the, the season. I think I think the thing with anything is if you recover from it and then you can, you can build on that, it can make you fitter. It's mm -hmm. just fitting in the recovery and making sure you recover. Obviously as a pro, all your time can be spent recovering, so you can get back into it fairly quickly. Uh, that wasn't all I did though, I then obviously also do 70.3s in between. Mm -hmm. So, And when you were doing those other races, like the ones that were kind of a, a build or a fitness boost or whatever, did you have different focuses in those races? Uh, yeah, 70.3s for me personally were almost always 
a kind of stepping stone. Uh, I seldom focused on them 100%. That was my my goal race. A few exceptions was maybe like when 70.3 World Champs came to South Africa. Yeah. That was obviously something I really focused on, although it didn't go well at all, but yeah, <laughs> Murphy's Law. Uh, but yeah, most of the 70.3s were kind of stepping stones to prepare me for an Ironman um, or a full distance race where I would either use it as a form finder or mm. I'd use it as a test of my fitness or just as a form booster, you know, like really test do a hot 70.3 to prepare for Kona or, or something like that. Um, that that was generally how I planned my season. Those those races, sometimes I'd do two 70.3s a week apart as a real like form yeah. booster. And in between that, you can pretty much just lie on your bed because you know you're going to get that fitness boost from each of those. Yeah, um, yeah I'd use the 70.3s as training. But would you ever like specifically do work like, okay, I'm going to absolutely kill the bike and then I'm just going to jog through the run? Or did you always just like race them like a full equal triathlon? Uh, seldom. There, there was times when if it, it was like, oh, if you're, if you're ahead, don't kill yourself to get yeah. a record time. Just stay in front of the guy behind you. Uh, you know, shut it down for the last 5Ks if you can or, or something like that. Um, and sometimes there were specific things we wanted to work on, like really taking the swim out hard or something like that. Um, but generally it was it was to see how you could put all three of them together because yeah. that's something you don't often get to do in training but you can do really well in a race where you've exactly. got, a, got the transitions and everything. So it was, uh, it was testing that before you went into yeah. a major Ironman. I think it's really key to point out here as well that how like all what you've talked about, I imagine most age groups are dreaming of are racing loads, that's like why we do triathlon, of kind of going, yeah, I need loads of recovery but you can't actually do it when you've got a day job and of just, you know, doing all of these back to back to get your fitness and having that rest of it, it's just not going to happen. So uh, the, it, it's really you know interesting and fascinating and kind of what we'd all aspire to but in reality yeah, I guess from, from that what what would you say age groupers should take from watching a pro race in their calendar planning it's very different for a pro like I said uh, I would plan those major ones and then everything else in between was very like last minute I would mm -hmm. enter races a week a week out I'd phone a race organiser and say uh, can I come do you know and do, who I am? Can I come? <laughs> no. <laughs> can I come and do your race? And and often I would do it occasionally, but we weren't allowed to. But yeah, I would I would be able to sign up for races at the last minute, which is obviously a luxury that mm. age groupers don't have. But I would say that what you can take from that is you need to have the pillars of your season planned mm. early, uh, and everything else you can kind of take it as it comes. And but you should plan those pillars of your season. Be yeah. it be it a world champs doesn't have to be a world champs. Your major race yeah. and everything else kind of builds towards that. And that way you don't get so hung up if a race doesn't go so well, or you don't have a good day, or, or you're not feeling good, or you get an injury because you know you can come back to get to that pillar. Yeah. Um, so really, that's how you should plan your season is have something that anchors your whole season and then everything else just yeah. builds and, and now that. is the perfect time for doing it, isn't it? January, you've got that kind of calendar ahead of you. We're, so, we're spoiled to have so many races as age groupers. But now you are, or oh, I'd say an age grouper, or retired, whatever <laughs> you want to cast yourself as, you're no longer a pro. What's, what's your pillars for 2022? Uh, well, I've entered a half marathon in March and that's Quite as far soon. as I've got. That's, that's literally you know, the that's only less, pillar that's less than two months away I'm now. aware. I'm very, very aware <laughs> of how close it is. I'm feeling very underprepared and unfit, but I am starting to train. I'm, I had a pretty good week of training. So nice. that's my first pillar. We'll take it as it comes from there, I think. And you, how about you? How have you planned your season? Well, I haven't gone much further than that either. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and I'm kind of very much like, I just like racing. I literally did a race yesterday and I got home and I loved it so much that I've entered a race for a few weeks' time, but then it's like, it's a nine mile cross country race. You know, so I'm when we say just... plan your whole season in advance, <laughs> do as we say, not as we do. <laughs> yeah, I think something like that. But we would love to know what you guys are doing. So whether it's going to give you motivation to make sure you enter that event or hold you accountable, do let us know in the comments section below what you've got planned for this year. Well, moving on to those running records we mentioned, we've got an American half and full marathon record. Well, Sarah Hall running on the same course in Houston that her husband, Ryan, did 15 years ago when he set the American half record, recorded a time of 67.15 to take 10 seconds off the previous record, which just did for four years. That was held by Molly Huddle. Yeah. She didn't actually win. Uh, that was The win was taken by Victory Chapangeno from Kenya in an American all-comers record of 65.03 and the 11th fastest ever half marathon in the world. Uh, Sarah Hall was second though, and in third place was Dominic Scott from South Africa. About an hour later, Kira Del Mato broke 
the women's full distance marathon record uh, in a time of 2 hours, 19 and 12 seconds. Well, she broke Dina Castor's American record, which has stood for 15 years, and she smashed it by 24 seconds. But interestingly, she's 37 years of age, and she's actually had seven years off running, had two children, got married, and then actually got a job as a realtor, which she still holds, but then refound that love of running and went and smashed this record. At 37 years old, very impressive. She did have a male pacer with her, but she won that marathon by over 10 minutes, which is very impressive. She had a very good day out running. On to some other news, and we've seen the first use of the Rodchenkov Act. If you're not familiar with the Rodchenkov Act, it is signed into law by Donald Trump in December 2020, and basically it makes it a crime for anyone to participate in any activity that influences the outcome of a major sporting event using doping. Essentially, it makes doping a crime. Yeah, so this means that instead of it just being down to USADA, the USA's anti-doping unit, to investigate any sort of doping offences, it actually moves it all the way up the scale to the FBI, who can look into any cases or any people that are involved or are suspicious of being involved in doping allegations. That's right. And now we've seen the first use of this, with charges filed in Manhattan against a person who has been investigated by the FBI and they've found evidence against this person. Yeah, well, these charges are actually against Erica Lira, who's a therapist that's been operating out of Texas. And they have been charged for distributing HGH and EPO to at least two athletes. Now, one of those athletes is believed to be Blessing Okabara, who actually ended up testing positive ahead of the Tokyo Games in the end. Yeah, she didn't actually compete because she was banned or provisionally suspended. Her investigation is still ongoing. They haven't brought in charges or banned her yet. Uh, but... Eric Lira has been charged now, uh, and basically they used the FBI's powers to seize her, her phone at the airport when she entered the country, the US Border and Customs Protection Agency, and they've got messages from her phone on WhatsApp to Eric Lira uh, saying various things like, I've used this amount, and uh, I've used that amount, and will I test positive if I do this today, and I've sent you this amount of money. Uh, so the evidence is quite mm, damning. It's quite incriminating. Yeah, and Eric Lira could face up to 10 years in prison. I'm not sure what you think about this. I think it's a pretty good move in the far, in the terms of the, the fight against doping. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to hear that the IOC and WADA weren't supporting this initially, not this um, exact situation, but the overall ruling of the There Sanchenko. have been quite a few objections from various parties, people seeing it as the American Americans politicizing doping to do investigations for all other kinds of reasons. But I do think that this is the kind of thing that sports needs if it's going to clean up its act. Uh, if you're going to get sport clean, you need these major investigations and you need the, all the powers to, to come together to pull in the right direction. It'll be interesting to see if any other countries follow suit. Yeah. Now it's time for What the Tech. And this might actually make you say, What the Tech? <laughs> the first voice controlled adjustable dumbbells. That's right, smart dumbbells. The Nordic Track iSelect adjustable dumbbells are the world's first smart dumbbells controlled by Alexa. I mean, dumb is right there in the name dumbbells <laughs> and they've made them smart. Essentially what it means is you can go and say, Alexa, make my dumbbells weigh 35 pounds and she will change them to 35 pounds. You then pick them up and do your workout and then you put them back down and say, Alexa, make the dumbbells 10 pounds and she'll make them 10 pounds. It's uh, smart dumbbells, because I mean, apparently you waste a lot of time if you've got adjustable dumbbells during your workout, changing the weight of them. I mean, I can tell you're a real fan of this new tech, James. I mean, you couldn't be sort of, you couldn't be selling it any further. I do understand that, it, you know, I've never used those weights when you do change them. I just go to the gym and pick up different weights. But I guess if you don't have much space and you don't want to be, like, the risk of them maybe falling off, I guess. I mean, yeah, if you have adjustable dumbbells and you have to take the plates off and put them on, I can see it being quite a pain and, and really wasting a lot of time in your workout. But for the cost and the convenience. You can also manually do them. You don't have to shout at them and say, Alexa, do this, Alexa, do that. You can put them on the plate and turn the little thing and it'll, it'll change them, but they're not cheap. So the recommended retail price, it says, is $429, but I clicked on the link to buy them because they're available you really on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, and it said it was going to charge me $787 Oof. for a set of dumbbells. That's membership to a good gym, isn't it? Exactly. You could you could buy a membership for quite a long time to a mm. decent gym for that. Uh, and you might be shouting at your dumbbells quite regularly saying, change the weight, change the weight, it's too heavy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether we need this kind of tech in our lives, but hey, it's available. It's there for you. Check it out to so the new smart adjustable dumbbells. 
On to race news, and we don't actually have anything triathlon related, but we do have a bit of a mammoth race in replacement. It was the Britain's Montaigne Spine Race, which consists of 430 kilometers of running pretty epic. Well, it was a bit of a tale of the hare and the tortoise and the men's race was won by Owen Keith in a time of 92 hours and 40 minutes. That's right. Debbie Martin Consani won the women's race in 104 hours and eight minutes. The race is, as Heather says, 430 kilometers follows the Pennine Way from just south of Manchester all the way through Scotland. Yeah, well, neither of the winners were actually leading for the majority of it, but they ended up sort of inheriting that first place due to the favourites having to drop out. And it just shows it's such a battle of attrition when it comes to a race like this. But interestingly, it was um, Owen Keith who used to have the men's record and he's lost that to John Kelly. But the overall record is still held by Yasmin Paris in a time of 83 hours, 12 minutes. So yeah, the women's record is still much quicker than the men's. Alrighty, it's time to take a look at your photos. And this first one has been sent in from Argo, who's over in the south of Estonia. It says, I took part in Estonia's winter endurance race, the Talihara Vanakuri 101K on foot. Now, this is quite interesting. It says, the event organizer actually originally took part in the UK's Montane Spine Challenger 108 mile race. So the smaller version of the spine race we were talking about earlier, back in 2017, and actually got inspiration for this race from that. Well, anyway, back to Argo he says it was my first time participating after taking a few years to consider it. But key points of their race temperatures were from zero to minus five. <laughs> Icy roads apparently fell on their butts three times. Thick and nearly unrunnable snow in the woods. Moonlit throughout. That sounds quite nice, actually. Um, but nearly 17 and a half hours in the wilderness. An unforgettable experience and test of willpower, I'd say. Um, in the second half, they walked more than they'd like, but satisfied he didn't give up. Yeah, he's given us his times there. 103 kilometre in 17 hours and 25 minutes. Uh, I mean, all I see when I look at those pictures is cold. I see beautiful scenery, but it's designed for skiing or not running. That's what I would say. It's so cold. Yes, yes, we know. We know how you feel, James. Yeah, okay. Well <laughs> Jean-Gabriel also said us this, he was avoiding the cold in his pain cave. So he's, uh, this is the first iteration of my pain cave based on available stuff, the rest of the wood from the works in his house. He's built a pretty cool uh, desk there, desk stand, uh, mm. a bit like the Wahoo uh, stand that we've got. It's, it's, it's really classy, yeah, I like it's it. It's really cool, he's got cup holders in it and space for the fans on top. Uh, he says, once the dedicated room is finished, the pain cave will move there and more improvements will be made. We look forward to seeing those improvements. Uh, keep up the hard work in this winter and keep warm. Yeah, do make sure you send in that update. And anyone else who's inspired by these, whether you're out racing at the moment, maybe more if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, or you're just sort of getting cosy in your pain cave, do share those photos using the uploader, which is on screen now, and it can also be found in the description below. Now it's time for the caption competition. And last week we had this image from Ironman 70.3 Mallorca of two people sitting just chilling in the water, as you do. Uh, starting off with this one from Cassie Rousseau, she said, with global warming, will they cancel a bike and run for once? Oh, oh. They do cancel a lot of swims these days, don't they? Yeah, I know, but wouldn't it be great? I'd, I'd like it that way around. They never cancel the bike, do no, they? No, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Steve C30, I might have left a tap on. Oh, yeah, flooding. Someone similar, T. Kevin Cotter, said, Do you think the tide is rising? Maybe we should move out of our chairs. Mm, maybe. <laughs> anyway, uh, Savage Pro is a good one here. Um, Noah said, No mask, no entry, and slowly shut the door. Oh, dear. I like that one. It's good, isn't it? Yeah. It's missed the boat. <laughs> <laughs> Phil Lamb said, And we're down to two in the musical chairs. Warm up before the swim leg. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But anyway, our winner is David McKay with this one. My coach said to keep my butt up in the water. I like uh, it. Uh, I like uh, it. Yeah, it's, it's clever, yeah, that one. Clever. Well, David, send us your details and we'll get a cap out to you. For this week, we've got this image of some dude looking at the pool. Is that, is that um, you know, showing how keen you are to go swimming? Is that uh, where I we're can, going with that one? I can tell you I spent a lot of time standing <laughs> next to the water procrastinating the start of my swim sessions. Yeah. <laughs> a um. lot of time. Well, if you have an idea of what I might be thinking in that image, uh, leave it down below with the hashtag caption competition and you could be winning a cap next week. 
Yeah, well, that pretty much rounds us up for this week. We've still got some great videos for you to look forward to. We've got how to train for your first marathon. So if you're feeling inspired and you're planning some goals, that could be a video to really just get you on track. And along with that, we've also got, have I got shin splints? Hopefully those two don't go hand in hand, but they are coming up this week. Yeah, also don't forget to head over to the GTN shop if you're looking for some merchandise. We've got all kinds of stuff on there, including the kit that you see us wearing in all of our videos. And if you're looking for something to watch right now, Heather did a pretty cool video on how to train when you're overweight. Overweight, running for overweight people, I guess. It's a pretty good video and interesting.